Well, it looks like it's one o'clock and I am supposed to welcome you today because um, I know Becky probably better than anybody on here, maybe. I don't know, uh, but I'm Andy Clements. I am the Associate Director for Research, Design and Implementation of Strong Brain Institute and have been working with as a member of this group for quite some time now. And I am delighted to introduce Becky Haas. She's gonna be presenting Moving Your Organization from Trauma-Aware to a Culture of Trauma-Informed. And um, I, I think we sent out a little bio for her before, but many of you probably know her. She is has been famous across the region about bringing the trauma-informed message to the area. Um, now she's famous across the world for that. Um, and I got to start out this work with her a long, long time ago. Um, back in 2015, but she is um, a mover and shaker and has kept us on track and informed of things going on nationally, internationally, and so forth. And I just want to turn it to, over to her. You're in good hands. Um, I trust everything she says and take it away, Becky. Thank you, Andy. The key to webinars is always have your close friends introduce you. Uh, no, I appreciate the kind things that she says and Andy will know as much as, as far as I'm concerned. No one's more surprised at how influential the opportunities have become, um, not only for my life and my work, but also for the Strong Brain Institute. So I'm delighted to be with colleagues today and to share a bit about this journey that we talk about. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Um, so when we think about, um, there we go. When we think about um, changing the culture whoop, in our organizations, uh, today we want to cover some best practices um, for moving an organization from trauma aware to where it's uh, more embedded in the culture so that uh, if you and I that are the firebrands for this topic, uh, we retire or we take a new job, that the, it doesn't go away. The conversation doesn't change. And then I'm going to give you a couple of examples of truly some trauma-informed programs out there. And then just because in an hour, it's hard to really cover uh, everything very deeply, we're going to give you a, a high-level view of um, assessments um, that are available, um, doing some things like environmental scans. This is some deeper work that I do sometimes as a consultant with an organization that wants somebody to help them along their journey. And then we're going to talk briefly about changing policies, procedures, staff well-being, and creating an action plan. So what's really the goal of this conversation? Well, I'm so glad you asked, because the goal of this is you know, if you ever remember the analogy with the fingers on a chalkboard, you know, when when I hear somebody and I can greatly appreciate it when people go to a 30 minute training or a 45 minute training. And then the next thing, you know, on maybe their website or whatever, they're saying we are a trauma informed organization. Well, it takes a bit more than that. So what is the goal today of our presentation? Our goal is to help show you some tools that are out there and resources resources and kind of share some roadmaps um, of some ways that can help you move from an awareness to where your board members know about it. You're, I'm on the board of the Johnson City Washington County Boys and Girls Club and um, our board fully knows about this when vendors come. Recently Pepsi came by and Food City. Uh, we have generous uh, benefactors in the community and when vendors even come by they're led on a tour, see the calming room. Uh, we have staff training in place there. We have volunteer training in place. It's in our job descriptions for new hires. We have calming areas not only in the main calming area but throughout the center. We have art that reflects um, uh, resilience and, and courage and things like that. So what is the goal? The goal is to help organizations move from just an understanding that there, there are many trauma survivors that work on our staff, as well as the consumers that we serve. And so I love this quote from the Missouri model. And I hope Andy and I often, when we began training in our early days together, we called it 
handing out the glasses. And recently I was speaking in Texas for the Texas Department of Juvenile Justice and, and they shared with me that they had had a workshop and they literally bought some inexpensive sunglasses and handed them out to everybody that was there, which I thought was really cool. But trauma informed should not feel like another program, uh, something else now we have to implement. But what is trauma informed? It's a fundamental shift in how programs are implemented, which I think puts a whole new light on moving to become trauma-informed. And so in my work, and trust me, there are a lot of varying opinions out here. Uh, I'm not sure who all is joining us today, but you know, I'm sure a dozen other people on this call could do a presentation on this topic. And we might describe a roadmap a little differently, but in my doing this work um, almost uh, 10 years now, um, we here's what I see happens as a result of raising a conversation around being trauma, trauma aware, trauma informed. So it improves outcomes on both ends. So on one end, we help create some healing environments. We um, are looking at practices that don't re-traumatize uh, individuals we serve, but the other side of the bookends is the prevention programs that begin to evolve. When you go out in your community, which is what Andy and I did starting back in 2014, um, we began sounding the trumpet in our community, over 4,000 people trained and three years on top of keeping our day jobs. And you know what people started to do? They started to create programs that support babies and support parents and caregivers, support young kids, support youth. And so we see that this conversation improves outcomes on both ends. So here's an example of the one end. This is a calming area at the Boys and Girls Club that I said about a minute ago. But here we have down in Carter County, Tennessee, um, a, a drug anti-drug coalition. They had a, a grant and then they wrote a park and rec grant. And they noticed that they had a lot of youth hanging out down in Elizabethan, down in the city. And, and they realized that many of these risks were coming, these youth were coming from at-risk situations. So they went out in the community and said, we want business people. We want, um, you know, uh, Civitan, folks in Rotary, you know, civic clubs, coaches, the faith community, anybody that would like to volunteer an hour a week or so to help mentor youth. And you know what? The community responded to the call. And before COVID in 2019, I, I was there training, uh, several rounds of training for their mentors. And then in my national work last year, I traveled to Augusta, Georgia, to Augusta University, to the Georgia Medical School. And in one photo where you see me, um, Dr. Vess Loomer in the orange blouse, she learned about ACEs. And she's overseeing a medical resident program at a highly rated uh, medical college. And then Julie Miller, she's over Georgia First, which is a program throughout the state of Georgia that works with at-risk children and youth. And these ladies came up with an idea that a part of the medical training for the residents would be to create a program to support youth. Who would think, who would think medical residents as a part of their their, their training are going to mentor youth. And this program is wildly successful. So the day that I was there teaching and sharing a keynote, they had the residents talk about the curriculum, how rewarding it was to them as facilitators, as well as we heard from the youth. And when I was there last summer, that in two years, they'd had 107 youth, at-risk youth, go through the program. And 98% of the youth said they were going to now go on to college. They felt like they had a caring adult in their life. So we want to see that the work that we do around the idea of trauma-informed is not only healing environments, but prevention. So becoming trauma-informed, it's not a destination, it's a journey. So I want you to know today, my approach to sharing this content with you is that there are a growing number of reliable roadmaps. This summer in July, my sweet husband, he'll be turning 70 and I've been trying to figure out what kind of trip I could take him on. And, and um, so anyway, we're gonna wander our way to St. Louis where our oldest son is doing an internship at Boeing this summer as he finishes up an engineering degree. And 
I have done everything except try to find the world's biggest ball of string or something like that on the way to St. Louis, because I really want to take a reliable, uh, I mean, I mean, an off the beaten path uh, trip for, for my husband's birthday. And you know what I've found? There are quite a few roads that we can take from Johnson City to St. Louis. Well, I'm, I'm here today to tell you that there's not just one roadmap out there anymore. And honestly, you don't really have to keep inventing it in my mind. And as a consultant helping organizations move through this process, I really rely on the wisdom that are, are found in several of these. So what we're gonna do is just do a little bit of a comparison. So the first one comes from the University of Buffalo. So in my work in the National Trauma Campaign, as a part of the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice, uh, we've had actually members from the Social Work Department of the University of Buffalo that's on our national core team. So I know of the fine work they've been doing for many years now. So this is downloadable for free. It's a couple hundred pages and you do have to enter your email. Um, so they keep a record of those um, that are, are, are requesting this. Um, but the purpose of this manual is to help guide organizations and systems in planning uh, for not only implementing, but also uh, sustaining a trauma-informed change. And truly this manual provides a step-by-step -step guide with tools intended for anyone interested in making this approach. Since January of 2019, this document has been downloaded more than 6,000 times by individuals and organizations spanning 52 countries across the globe, as well as every US state. And a primary way they set this one up is three stages of change. There's pre-implementation, implementation, and then of course, very important, sustainability. So under the pre-implementation areas, they begin to start a conversation around leading and communicating. And I know in the Strong Brain Institute and Dr. Dixon, who's in the call today, and Ben, and many of our Dr. Mosher, um, you know, we often have conversations about how critical it is in processing change in any organization or any community that we have a high level of leadership buy-in. And so in the pre-implementation phase in the Buffalo model, you begin to look at leading and communicating, hiring and orientation, establishing a safe environment, collaborating with partners and referrals, reviewing policies and procedures. And then we move to the second phase, which would be the, um, hold on just a minute. I'm gonna move this. Okay. Um, in the implementation phase, we still continue the conversation around leadership, around hiring, but now we want to think about training clinical and non-clinical staff. And in my work, I see a need for both. We can do generalized training on the basics, but we also need to have conversations around skill building um, and helping to, uh, clinicians uh, or police officers or judges to see that there are some strategies out there in the field and that a lot of this work, we really don't need to reinvent the wheel. What we really need are navigators that help to lead the way. And then we talk about preventing secondary traumatic uh, stress in staff, a safe environment. Are we going to screen for trauma? Or are we going to use a universal precaution approach? And now what's really important, once you do some screening, who's going to do the treating of the trauma? And then we want to think about collaborating with our partners and outside referrals. And we begin a conversation about policies and procedures. And then when we move to the next area of sustainability, now we wanna look at evaluation. And if you're in the middle of doing this process with an organization or maybe a school system or a health department or in the justice field, you know, it's very important as we go along where we can to capture some evaluating and, and monitor the success of change because I can promise you doing work nationally and even internationally that more and more organizations are, are wanting to learn. Uh, this past February, I shared with my colleague in the UK, Dr. Warren Larkin, and uh, we shared to 450 individuals, the Academy of Social Justice 
in the UK. And at the end, Dr. Larkin said he'd never seen a group stay on for questions and answers like he did that day. And the theologians, many were university faculty from across the UK. And they said, Becky, it's so inspiring to see your photographs of what could happen in a library, what could happen uh, with justice, what could happen in a clinic with doctors and, and on and on, because they said, we've known about this in the UK in theory, but now you're helping it come alive in practice. And folks, that's where the evaluating and monitoring can come in to play, writing technical guides of how programs can be replicated. And then in the sustainability phase, we also revisit our areas of one through nine in implementation. Okay, my second choice for, uh, I feel like it's a Miss America pageant here. Uh, so now Miss Kentucky here, uh, we're gonna talk about this one. And I want you to pay attention to some of the organizations that developed them because their focus was maybe a little different than another group. This is kind of like climbing Roan Mountain and maybe we're five of us are at the base of Roan Mountain and we're going to take five different paths to get to the top to the where we connect to the Appalachian Trail. And, you know, we will see some similarities in our hike when we compare notes at the top, but each of us will see some differences. So this one comes from the Institute for Health and Recovery. Now the Buffalo one's free and you just download it. This one's only probably about 50 pages. It costs $18. Um, but I put the link on all the slides so you can find all the materials. The reason I like this one um, is that it is person centered. And obviously, if you're working around health and recovery, then person centered is going to be key in your conversation. It's aimed at helping individuals to achieve their maximum potential in all areas of their lives and to be collaborative, respectful, open sharing, fostering, competence, it's strength-based and to gain confidence. So can you see how someone is in a recovery program that maybe these are some um, areas that maybe your focus would be a little bit more on than just trauma-informing a hospital or a university or a health department. Some of my favorite tools from this one are, they have wonderful checklists. I tell you, it's worth well, to me, well worth the 18 bucks to get the checklists that are in there. It has a template for developing a trauma-informed integration plan. And they ask questions like, who are your champions? Last week, Dr. Clements and I were sharing for the United Way in Southwest Virginia, uh, over in Abington, and that was a lot of the conversation about how to move that work forward, or who are our champions? Who are the ones that, like Andy and I, when we first started, were willing to do this along with our day job uh, because we so passionately believed in it? And then we want to think about the top managers who have drafted a policy stating a statement in support that we are gonna to begin to transition to becoming trauma-informed. And then we wanna think about who are various roles to participate. You know, when I work with a school as I have with uh, Smith County Schools in Marion since 2019, you know, during COVID-19, uh, Dr. Carter, the superintendent, we recorded a, a video that was for the bus drivers, for the cafeteria workers, for the custodians, because we don't just want the frontline uh, individuals, but for it to be thoroughly trauma-informed, we want to hear the voices from the custodian, from the cafeteria, because in a school setting, those are two other roles that can really be uh, an encouraging touch point for children. This manual also has some great organization self-assessments. It has a staff practice survey, which I am nuts about, because I'm really a, more about helping people develop that they understand this, you know, uh, being around all these great uh, faculty at ETSU now in this work through Strong Brain Institute, sometimes in our meetings, we'll be talking about setting up a meeting for something else. And one of the faculty will say, well, I've got a lecture that day, or, oh, I've got a lab that day. Well, you know what, when it comes to trauma and form, I think we need the lecture and the lab approach that we need to be able to set it up where people can demonstrate the skills of understanding this approach. And this is another part that's my favorite. There is a supervisor 
a guide for self-check and helping to move supervisors along in using a trauma-informed approach in supervision. Okay, the next one. So this is Miss Nevada, I guess. Uh, we've got a trauma-informed approach to workforce. So now notice again, a little shift in the title. Now, all of these I like, but I personally have all of them in my library. Obviously I do, because I wouldn't be able to give this talk. But to me, they bring a collective wisdom that I like to know about from people that have forged the path ahead of me, okay? So notice the emphasis here on workforce. So this is an, an introductory guide for employers and workforce development organization. It was actually assembled by the National Fund for Workforce Solutions. I know Andy had to leave the call for another meeting, but just a, a little shout out. I did not know that this was in there, but on page 23, this guide actually references the using a toolkit that Dr. Clements and I wrote in 2019 with the Building Strong Brains Tennessee grant on how to trauma inform your community. Um, and so that's recommended as a resource. But here's one of the gems that you'll find inside this. I use this PDF, I made a PDF of this page and I use it often in my work. So this helps employers in a simple infographic to see, I can come in and talk at the chamber about trauma and trauma informed care and you know, but when you show this graphic to people, what does this look like at work? Well, it looks like tardies and absenteeism. But, you know, just like when I'm training teachers, when we see a child falling asleep in school, instead of meeting it with a punitive approach, you know, maybe instead we understood that police were in the house during the night. Maybe a caregiver was arrested. So when we see these behaviors at work, it might possibly mean I didn't sleep last night. I'm so stressed out. I've got bills to pay, getting the kids to school on time, trying to keep my job. Well, what about individuals on the job with bad interview skills? Maybe they lack the skills. Maybe they are, are seem fearful to make uh, eye contact. Do they have something to hide, you wonder, as an employer? Are they not to be trusted? But did you know that eye contact is intimidating and it triggers abuse that I've experienced in the past after talking back? Or what about a high turnover? Employees' chaotic lives often disrupt their performance. And what that could mean is that I don't know how much of my life is okay to share at work. It's impossible to tune out the abusive relationship I have to go home to. And so this lens, using the National Fund uh, Toolkit, it helps you to give the lens from really looking at what as far as from an employer's standpoint and how to have a more resilient or really a more healing cultured workplace. All right, then here's the grandmother. All right, here would be, I don't really know the oldest state. I, I, I hate to say that about myself, but here would be the grandma of them all, SAMHSA tip 57. You know, I'm surprised in national work that I do that many people do not know about tip 57. Well, it's unusual to have a tip that's 300 pages long. <laughs> that sounds like a tip I would write. I'm pretty wordy. OK, but we have tip 57. But see, the whole first part of the tip is all about understanding trauma, the four R's, uh, the six pillars, that kind of stuff that we cut our teeth on in this conversation. But the second half is all about implementation. And uh, and we're going to look at these things that they put in as far as implementation that we want to commit to creating a trauma-informed agency. You know, now we're at a place in this work where, you know, it's almost peer pressure. You know, I feel like at a director's meeting, you hear a conversation or grants are emerging out there. And I think some people feel it might be in their best interest to say, we're going along with the herd. But folks, it takes a little bit more than that and that we need a genuine commitment to creating a trauma-informed agency. We wanna look at creating an, in, an initial infrastructure to initiate, to support, and to guide the changes. And uh, we wanna involve key stakeholders. Now, in my opinion, this is the sweet spot of SAMHSA, okay? You will not pick up a piece of material that I have on this topic from SAMHSA and not see this in there 
to involve stakeholders, including consumers who have histories of trauma. You know, oftentimes we hear people talking about if you're going to create a program for me, then don't do it without me. That we need to have voices of those who maybe have um, LGBTQ. TQ or the transgender voice or historic racism, or maybe uh, domestic violence survivors, or maybe people that are working in an institutional setting where maybe the opportunities for advancement aren't, aren't there as clear of a path. And so we need to have the, the, the voices of our consumers um, and those that we serve as a part of our journey. And then we want to access whether to the extent of the organization's policies and procedures um, are currently trauma informed or do they interfere with the development of this. And you know, when I work with an organization, I really like to start off on a positive note. And I encourage organizations to do an inventory, you know, even just as I've, I mean, I worked at ETSU for eight years uh, back before I worked at the police department and then at Ballot Health, but I, I'm pretty familiar with ETSU, but coming back now with Strong Brain Institute and interaction with faculty and things like that, um, you know, it, it reminds me of, you know, different things going on and all. And, um, but just hearing the faculty talk about things like a program for students that if teachers have a concern about a student or maybe learn of a, of a death in a student's family, there's an internal mechanism where you can um, help support that student uh, by sharing it maybe with some other faculty. And, you know, and so I think sometimes if we would begin in our journey to look around and we probably have some things in place that are already going down the road. And so we start off kind of a win-win that we've already got some things going along in a trauma-informed approach. And that's a thing SAMHSA brings up. Then we also, in the SAMHSA guide, talk about an organizational plan to implement and support the delivery of TIC within this agency. And they, this is another sweet spot, I think, that SAMHSA is very good about. Their 2014 concept paper, which is kind of what Andy and I got on the road with, was to use cross-sector collaboration. And that they talk about that as a part of the implementation, is creating collaborations between providers and consumers and other service providers uh, and from various agencies. Then you put your plan together and then reassess the plan as you move along. You know, sometimes this is, a, this is doing well. You know, my dad uh, who's deceased now, but he always loved sailing. And when we lived in Miami and New Orleans, he always had a little sailboat and we would go out. And I'll never forget one time in New Orleans, we'd hauled the boat down to Lake Pontchartrain and we're getting ready to go out. And, and one of us kids was responsible to put the rudder in the car. And, you know, it's like interrogation in a crime scene. Daddy was like, who, who forgot the rudder? We can't take the boat out on the lake without the rudder, you know? And so sometimes we may be getting out there a little bit and we need to stop and say, wait a minute, is this change here? Does we need to give a little bit of shift? Did we, did we forget the rudder, you know? So as we move forward with uh, implementation, never feel, uh, you know, don't feel concerned if we wanna stop and see are our program changes being effective or not. And then we wanna implement quality improvement. That's another sweet spot for SAMHSA. They're all about evaluation. You know, think about things like, have you called your own, your own organization lately? Have you called to see how hard it is or easy to get an appointment with you? You know, is it easy to come into your facility? And so sometimes we need to evaluate and see about our services. And then we wanna institute practices that to support sustainability, such as ongoing training, clinical supervision, consumer participation, feedback and resource allocation. I think SAMHSA does a really good job also of talking about finances for this. You know, in organizations that I've trained, like last summer, um, working with Florida State University to train Anthem Health. Well, when you're an organization that wants to train 800 call center, telehealth, all the various roles, 
Well, there's going to be a cost associated with that um, because you're going to pay people to come to work and be two or three hours all in a training. And so SAMHSA brings up the talk, the conversation about allocating funding. Okay, and then really the Missouri model, which is something probably most of you are aware of. Um, and it's probably one of the better known traveled paths. So when I'm looking at my trip with my husband to St. Louis this summer for his birthday and see our kids, you know, I could just jump on Interstate 26, grab 40 in Knoxville, blah, blah, blah. That's just boring to me. I want to go through Paducah. I want to stay at, eat at breakfast at Teresa's, which is a five-star place in Bowling Green or, you know, something like that. But the Missouri model is pretty good, tried and true. So the Missouri model basically uses a framework of four things, trauma-aware, trauma-sensitive, trauma responsive and trauma informed. But you know what? I've heard some of the biggest names in this business, Stephanie Covington out in California an author for the Betty Ford Foundation, so widely respected in this. And, and she flips the terms all around. So another thing that I wanna say to you is that, you know, let's don't get caught in the weeds on the terms. Let's just be transformative in the work that we do. So the Missouri model is a trauma-informed approach that brings an ongoing organizational process. Most people in the field emphasize that trauma-informed, this is so important, is not a program model that can be implemented and then monitored with a checklist, okay? It again is a paradigm shift in knowledge, perspective, attitudes, and skills it comes to deepen and unfold over time. You know, I feel that way after doing this work about a decade. More and more, it's like the light continues to get brighter and brighter. Often the Missouri model is referred to as a continuum of implementation where organizations move through stages. You know, like raising children when they're babies and doing things that are cute and all, but you know, now in their 30s, if my sons did a couple of things when they were toddlers, it, it wouldn't be quite as funny, you know. Um, and so that's the way this work, this work matures as well. And the continuum begins with being becoming trauma aware and moves to sensitive, responsive and trauma informed. So just a couple of quick definitions about each phase trauma aware means that we're now aware of how prevalent trauma is. And the, the organization is beginning to consider, you know what, it might impact our clientele and our staff. The trauma sensitive lens is where we've begun to explore the principles of trauma informed, the SAMHSA six pillars within the environment and daily work, build a consensus, you know, in the lobby or the lunchroom, you know, begin to have some conversation around some of these principles and consider the implications of adopting this in our organization. And we prepare for change. Whoop. Well, got a little ahead of myself here. Okay, trauma responsive organizations. Well, it's got a life of its own here. Hold on. I don't know why it's advancing. Okay, trauma responsive organizations have begun to change their organizational culture to highlight the role of trauma and all levels of the organization of staff begin, I don't know what's going on, sorry, begin to rethink the routines and, and infrastructure. And then fully trauma informed is where now we have trauma responsive practices and it's the norm. The trauma model has become so accepted, it's thoroughly embedded, and this is key. It no longer depends on a few leaders to keep it moving forward. That's where, again, we're going with this. And an organization now works with other partners to strengthen and collaborate around being trauma-informed. All right, so after sharing those models, let's take a quick look at this little video, about six minutes long, of a trauma-informed organization. Now, I want you to hear it from foster care lens, clinical lens, the patients are involved, and look how thoroughly it's saturated into the fabric of this program. When my foster daughter first came to live with us, the house was in chaos. Um, everybody was on pins and needles. We never knew when she was going to throw a tantrum. We could be sitting down watching television, and all of a sudden, she just...
I apologize. I don't know what's going on here. When my foster daughter first came to live with us, the house was in chaos. Um, Everybody was on pins and needles. We never knew when she was going to throw a tantrum. We could be sitting down watching television, and all of a sudden, she just explode. He was real agitated constantly. Uh, any little thing set him off. Uh, there was just so much anxiety, and uh, you know, just just so hard, like hard to get through the day. She would pull knives, um, any type of utensil, brooms, pots. He threw urine on a counselor. Uh, he would had a hard time sleeping at night. And he had a severe history of all kinds of trauma. They've been abused, they've been sexually assaulted. You really got to find out what it is that has traumatized them and try to figure out what's the best method to use to assist them as far as getting the assistance that they can live a productive life. What I'm most proud of is that her tantrums are zero now. And I don't think that if I was with trauma-informed care, it would have been this way, not this, not this soon. So trauma-informed care for our organization has meant that we've had much more effective interventions with kids. So many of us in the field have been waiting for a long, long time for something like trauma-informed care to come along. We've had the opportunity to learn from many of the premier experts who have been studying trauma and trauma's impact. And we have taken their wisdom, combined it with our own, to produce what we call our seven essential ingredients. The first ingredient is the notion that the prevalence of trauma is way more common than people care to acknowledge and or appreciate. Ingredient number two is the notion that the impact of trauma has the potential to change people physiologically. The third ingredient, we talk about going from a concept of what's wrong with you to what happened to you. They see a child that's being oppositional, that's arguing, maybe very aggressive, maybe hurts the family dog, and they don't understand well, we can help them understand. With well, trauma-informed care and the shift in our perspective of how we do things, now we will walk the person through it, find out what triggered this, and try to get a different perspective on what's going on with them to trigger these emotions. When a child goes through trauma, there's damage done to the brain. So by doing the rhythmic and repetitive activities, it actually helps develop the brain and develop those parts of the brain that have been traumatized. If stress is the big bad wolf and your lower brain is made of straw, when stress comes, you fall apart. But if we can use pattern repetitive activities and build your lower brain as a house of bricks, when the big bad wolf comes, we can stand firm and we don't melt down and have tantrums. All kinds of things work for this that are rhythmic, they're, they're very patterned, repetitive. The kids start to calm down. Well, when they calm down their brain, they're able to listen and learn. One of the best things that caregiver can do is represent to them that I am calm and you can also be calm. And when you combine that with some of these other techniques and ideas, uh, you have the magic that we keep describing. We had an 11-year-old boy come to St. Amelia Lakeside, and he had a severe history of abuse, physical, sexual, and emotional. We decided to implement trauma-informed care into his everyday activities, and as a result of that, he stopped being so aggressive and violent. He stopped destroying property. His overall demeanor changed completely. One of the most important things I found is the relationship, the relationship you form with the child through the trauma-informed care. There it is, there's the beginning of the trust and it might be the beginning of a different life for that child. Our sixth ingredient reason to be is about the idea that everybody needs a sense of purpose. I've gained a lot of self-discipline, self-control, 
and outside of like the martial arts class, I've been able to do things with other people I've never been able to do before. Anecdotally, I could share all kinds of stories about kids who have learned to regulate themselves, have had less episodes of aggression, which impacts how they feel about themselves and how they can manage their own stress level. None of this happens unless the caregivers providing this service are in a good place themselves. If we don't pay attention to them, then everything else won't work the way we want it to. When it's presented to police officers, to correctional folks, to educators, they all have a different perspective. And they all walk away with concrete ideas about how they can start to make a difference in the lives of the kids that they're working with. I mean, it's really been helpful to the staff because they want to do the right thing and they want to have the tools to do that. And it's changed their perspective. It's changed how they see the people they serve and how they can help create that relationship so that the child can heal. When you see those changes in a child, it makes you feel very good. Those are the stories that you'll never forget and makes you proud of doing trauma-informed care. The activities with the counselors, it just helps me out so much. It soothes my anxiety and calms down my irritableness. If it hadn't been for them, I don't know where I would be right now with her. And I thank them for this. Please use trauma-informed care. It works. If you think about it, if we all become more trauma-informed, we will have a healthier community. Pretty remarkable stuff. It truly is. Now, of course, in that example, we uh, it's a clinical example, but did you notice that they interviewed occupational therapists, the director of it, foster care parents, um, the caseworker, the, 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 the group home um, individual that stays, you know, there through the day or weekends or nights. Did you see how that every individual saw through their lens um, and the job that they did, the value of using a trauma-informed approach, okay? Now, here's a totally different kind of organization. And again, here's another place that I wanna encourage you to not get caught up in the weeds because it isn't a fidelity checklist. What it looks like in your organization may be totally different um, for someone else. You know, you're really in charge of how the shift is made. Um, but you want to see that for each organization, there may be similarities while there may be differences. So my good friend, Chuck Price, he was uh, 27 years in the foster care system in the state of Wisconsin. He was in leadership. He uh, was elected by his peers to be a regional uh, manager, director of different uh, uh, health and human service agencies. And he himself was the director of Wapaka County, uh, the Wapaka County Department of Human Health and Human Services, okay? And so as he learned about trauma-informed care, they took a two-year journey to begin um, to implement this system-wide in their organization. And on my next slide, there's a link that you can go and get this 20-some page um, report of what happened with less staff turnover. And think about it. This is folks that are have the ability to put a child into custody, state custody. So there's a high turnover rate often in that field, but they saw more of a workplace wellness. So often now in consulting, Chuck's now a consulting, blue collar consulting, and we do some projects together. But the opening um, couple of pages of his organization says, imagine that your agency has no child or youth placed in residential care. Decrease the number of children in your out of home care by 17%. Look at this one. Your child welfare agency moves 25% of the budget to prevention services because the need for deed in services now is declining. And the families served by your agency are treated by your employees at the level of compassion they would offer their own loved ones. 100% of your employees are trained in trauma-informed care, and now your turnover rates are less than 6%. And then in becoming a trauma-informed Wapaka County Department of Health and Human Services, does it sound unbelievable, unachievable? 
It's not. It's a true story of a journey of a mid-sized jurisdiction in Wisconsin. This story is one of delivering care in a trauma-informed way, one step at a time. And then the link at the bottom is to the report of the behind the curtain account of how this happened. And I think another reason Chuck and I kind of gel in doing work together is we're both storytellers and they really did a fabulous job in writing this report up in, in kind of that fashion. And then the permanence and well-being of the outcomes they saw begin to surpass historical records that had ever been achieved, not only by the, their own jurisdiction there, but also similar kinds of services across the country. So we want you to know that by the building blocks, that as you move through the continuum, by moving through the continuum, your efforts will gain traction by understanding each step builds on the step before it. And I like this slide. This is actually a couple of slides I got from Chuck. So here we are. We're ready. We're talking about it. Staff meeting. Who wants to change? All the hands go up. We're going to talk about trauma-informed care. Now, who wants to change? <laughs> Maybe not so fast, you know, uh, because sometimes it might mean taking a look at things and thinking outside the box. But the next slide, this is really my favorite quote now in this work. I probably don't do a presentation without sharing it because professionals, I wanna encourage you that this is why it's so encouraging to come together like we do around the Cure, the Cure or the Resilience Series or our own Strong Brain Institute meetings or meetings that you're in because it's kind of like a family reunion to get around this conversation and you're kind of energized again by other people because this is a total shift in the way that we've been doing things many times. So the electric light, did not come from the continuous improvement of candles. Even Thomas Edison himself talked about 10,000 times that he made mistakes before the actual bulb was uh, invented uh, or that he had a reliable bulb. And, and so we're kind of in some of that messy middle now uh, as we navigate this change, all right? So next, we just wanna give a high level view here and wrap it up so we can have a few minutes for questions. So organizational assessment, so every one of the resources that I shared with you earlier has some assessment recommendations or embedded in it are some options. So uh, the, the Buffalo one, for instance, University Health in San Antonio, Texas, 9,000 employees in a huge flagship hospital. You might've heard their name recently. They service some of the, the families that tragically were involved in the Uvalde shooting. Um, and so they have used the Buffalo model but the Buffalo model assessment's only 10 questions long, but yet it's been very effective in them moving the scale in, at University Health. Then there's the Arctic scale, which many are aware of. Uh, I believe there was a period they offered it for free, but I believe there is a charge for it. And again, you can uh, you know check out all the links. This one is recommended. Uh, I kind of use a blend of this and a few other things that I had uh, ETSU build out a survey in REDCap um, that I that I can uh, you know build in some budget for when I'm working with an organization. Uh, but this one is available for free, um, a trauma informed organizational assessment. And it's uh, kind of along the lines, Roger Fallett with the Missouri model, and you can find it at that link. Okay, now let's think about what our assessment should be taking a look at. Our physical environment, our staffing, our staff competencies, including trauma-informed supervision. We want to think about a safe emotional environment for both participants and our staff. But beyond that, we want to think about a safe physical environment for participants and staff. And then we think about empowerment approach. Are our programs strength-based? Do we promote a sense of empowerment, voice, and choice? And are we gonna use screening and assessment or are we gonna use a universal precaution approach? And then we do what I call an environmental scan. My goodness, I do not know why this is shutting off. Um, so now, um, we want to think about environmental scan. So I have a uh, environmental scan that I use as a, a consultant. 
Um, but there are some examples out there, but just to give you a taste of what it is, we wanna do a walkthrough of your property and building. Are there clear signs? When I worked for the healthcare system here locally, we were able to do a walkthrough through a couple of the different facilities and look, is there clear signage? Where are restrooms? Is the entrance marked? Is there adequate parking? Is there lighting? And then we move through the lobby. Is it welcoming? Does it display office hours? Are we greeted? You know, it shouldn't just be Chuck E. Cheese where we go in, welcome to Chuck E. Cheese, you know, but, but is there somebody there greeting us? I've been through buildings before and you're wandering around looking for an office. Hello, can someone guide me here? Um, and are things clearly marked and are there privacy areas and is there music? I mean, certainly some of these are, it's a, certainly these things are uh, elective, you know, it doesn't mean one size fits all, but just things to think about. And then lighting. One of my a real uh, rewarding uh, thing was working with community corrections a few years ago. And you do not get the lighting changed in corrections very often, but they were able to convince the manager that they could soften up some of the treatment rooms and open up some of the natural light um, in, in that environment. And then artwork, is it empowering? Is it hopeful? Maybe is artwork done by any consumers? Is it calming? And what about your consumers? Is there any way that you can celebrate progress? And I know certain settings, it's gonna be confidential, but you know, if you, uh, uh, I know uh, big companies, Tennessee Eastman that's here in the area and different things like that, there's incentives when employees come up with an idea that might save the company money, there's bonuses and, you know, and so do we have a way to celebrate our staff or our consumers and are they kept informed and is there collaboration? And then in our reception area, it, are we, is there a need for it to be bilingual? Again, reception, uh, restrooms marked, and the TV use. You know, where I get my car serviced, I don't think the dealership owner is on this call today, even though he's a great friend. Um, but you know what? They're playing the news, and I do not want to listen to an hour of news while my car oil's being changed, you know? Now, you may be a news, uh, uh, you know, you like the news, uh, but, you know, for me, I just rather take a break sometimes from sitting somewhere and being, having the news forced on me. So I'll bring a book to read or bring along my laptop and I found a little bench outside where I can sit while they're doing a tune-up or whatever on my car. Okay, and then we want to think about policies, that our policies are values and principles that demonstrate the trauma-informed care. Um, and some of the things we want to think about is when we create a policy that there are standards and that there's requirements. So here's an example of uh, building an implementation committee uh, that would include representatives from our staffs, from our consumers, and that our primary focus is to ensure the building and maintaining of trauma-informed care in the organization. And that all the staff, including direct staff, is trained, has ongoing training, and training needs to be updated. And then lastly, that we're trained in understanding what trauma is and the principles, but knowing how it impacts a child's life and the strategies to mitigate the effect. And then understanding we don't want to re-traumatize. So can you see kind of how with our policy language, we want to build it out and not always be really super general or vague. And then st staff, self, self, uh, staff uh, well-being is a priority. I think one thing we see through COVID now is more and more organizations realize that that is a priority. So a great tool that I found and use in organizations often is called the Vicarious Trauma Toolkit. And it was developed by the Virginia Office for Victims of Crime. Now you may think, oh, victims of crime, it's just for a justice setting. Nope, it can be wide, there's a wide application, but it also talks about ways to have an organizational response to vicarious trauma. It also is informed by research and lessons learned in the field and it provides guidance on using the tool. And actually the training is free webinars online. So you can download the toolkit, you can watch free webinars to understand how to implement it. And another one I like is the professional quality of life scale, whether I'm training hospital workers or whether I'm training police officers, we really need to have the tools. And the professional quality of life scale is a free 
a self-assessment. You can take it every 20 days. One day I was actually teaching or speaking at the West Virginia Handle with Care Conference and some uh, folks at the end came up and made me aware that professional quality of life was on an app called Provider Resilience. It's a much better application if you have a, an iPhone. Android, it, it, it's still there, it's free, but it's, it looks a little cheesier last time I saw it, but it's got a real simple menu of things, mindfulness, exercise, but the professional quality of life is embedded into it. And it's just some simple questions that you go through. It's about, I think, 30 questions. And at the end, it immediately scores for compassion satisfaction, compassion fatigue, and secondary trauma. All right, my last video here, and I want you to listen to how Robin here, who is a manager, look, look at how seamlessly she moves through recognizing secondary trauma in her team. And we'll wrap this up. Well, I was actually on a job interview in La Crosse, and I did CPR on someone who didn't make it. Went home, didn't go to my interview, and I got called by the fire chief. And he says, I heard what you did, kiddo, and I think you should become an EMT. I didn't even know what an EMT was at the time. My name is Robin Schultz, and I'm the Director of Emergency Services at HSHS Sacred Heart and St. Joseph's Hospitals in Eau Claire and Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. I currently oversee the emergency departments at both hospitals, uh, ER, urgent care, EMS, and trauma departments. You don't know what you're getting into in, in the field, right? You could be on the interstate in the middle of the night, no lighting, cars whizzing by you, can't see all the bleeding. There's plenty of death that we are dealing with. And I think early on I learned that I had to uh, listen to my feelings and actually feel what I was feeling and it was okay to be scared or angry that the person didn't live. And I blamed myself. If you don't deal with your feelings, listen to your feelings and address the feelings, they're going to come back and they can come back in a negative way. You have to allow yourself the time to address however you're feeling, good, bad, otherwise. If you don't do that, you could be taken out of the game and not respond to the next emergency call. That's when I would step in and, and check on that person or those people. What's going on? How are you feeling? You know, and let them know it's okay to feel bad. You're going to feel bad, you're gonna feel crummy. But if you start having chest pain or you're dizzy or you're anxious or you can't catch your breath, that's not okay. Let's talk about what we should do if those things happen. We want to help them heal them and get them back in that seat to help their neighbor for the next emergency that pops along. Reach out and ask for help. It's to recognize that you are not alone in this world and that there are people here that care for you and will help you no matter what. It's okay to ask for help. All right, so organizational change, you recognize the connection between trauma and poor outcomes, embrace the fact that we wanna change, we have a responsibility to change. The good news is that from ACEs, what's predictable for is preventable. You don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. And I love this slide of a Mississippi firefighter waiting on the wings chopper for a little child to be transported. And what's that firefighter doing? He's watching Happy Feet on his phone with that child child. So we see that this is supported by science. So no matter how large or small your organization, you can begin to bring change. And think about it as another shift in our society, is that we saw over many years, decades even, where tobacco went from being cool to now you can't even smoke on a college campus or a hospital. So there's my contact information. I know I failed miserably at leaving time for questions, but I hope uh, that gave you some information to think about. I don't know, are we done? Anybody? Thanks, Becky. Really appreciate your time today. And uh, sure. um, I know we, do, we are out of time. I had some questions for you, but I get to see you all the time so I can save them. Okay. Um, 
I really appreciate your time and everyone joining us today. I will send uh, any questions you have. If you want to forward to me, I'll put my uh, email in the chat right now. And I can forward um, any questions to Becky or it puts you in contact with Becky. Uh, maybe you're interested in um, doing some further consultation with her. She's been great for the Strong Brain Institute and I know she'd be great for your organization also. Hey Ben, will... you only sent your email to me, not to everyone. Oh, well, Michelle, I thought you didn't have my email. <laughs> Let me send it to everybody. Um, here's my email. If you have any questions about the SBI or future resilience um, series presentations, please reach out. And um, yeah, thanks again. Here is my email. And I will stay on for another minute or two so you can write that down. Uh, but thanks again. Uh, today's session is over. We hope you enjoy the afternoon. Thank you.